Hello, and welcome to JD Advising's California Bar Exam Essay Guide. The goal of this guide is to help you find an effective and efficient approach to the California Bar Exam essays right from the very beginning. This guide will help you feel confident on test day so that you can conquer the essay portion of the California Bar Exam. If you have any questions about this or other resources we offer for the California Bar Exam, please don't hesitate to contact us. Some of our other resources include a California Bar Exam prep course, private tutoring, essay feedback, and one sheets. If you reach out to us, we'd be happy to speak with you about the resources that can best help you prepare for the California Bar Exam. We hope you enjoy this guide and good luck on the exam. Torts is regularly tested on the California Bar Exam essays, so in this video, we'll discuss some tips for success on those torts essays. First, know how torts is tested. California has always tested general law rather than California law in torts questions. So you can apply the same law on the essays that you learned for the torts multiple choice questions. Torts is usually tested on its own, but we have seen it tested as a crossover question a couple times. The most likely crossover subject is remedies, which we saw in February 2017. We also previously saw it crossed over with civil procedure and professional responsibility. Sometimes real property questions test nuisance, which is technically a tort, but the examiners simply label the question real property and they don't consider that a crossover question. Next, be aware of the highly tested issues in torts. Negligence is by far the most tested issue in torts but we also do see intentional torts and products liability tested quite a bit. Let's start by discussing some of the key concepts from negligence that often come up. One of the things we frequently see tested within negligence is premises liability. In premises liability cases, the standard of care the premises possessor owes depends on the status of the plaintiff. The plaintiff could be an undiscovered trespasser, a discovered trespasser, a licensee, or an invitee. An undiscovered trespasser is not owed any duty of care. However, a premises possessor cannot engage in willful or intentional misconduct. So you cannot set up a spring-loaded shotgun to go off and shoot someone who trespasses on your property. Next, a premises possessor owes a very small duty to a discovered trespasser. Here, the premises possessor must warn or make safe any unreasonably dangerous, concealed, artificial conditions that the premises possessor knows of. To remember this rule, I like, it, I like to break it down into four parts. The premises possessor has to warn about dangers that are, number one, unreasonably dangerous, number two, concealed, number three, artificial, and number four, the possessor must know about the danger. So for example, if there is a downed power line in my backyard and it's hidden by the tall grass because I haven't cut my grass in a while, and I know that my neighbor regularly cuts through my backyard to get to his friend's house, which is behind me, I have a duty to warn my neighbor about that downed power line. It is unreasonably dangerous, it is concealed by the tall grass, it is artificial, and I know about it. Next is the duty owed to licensees. Licensees are social guests who have permission to be on the property. Here the premises possessor must warn or make safe all concealed dangers that the premises possessor knows of. So for instance, if my friends come over for dinner and I know that there is a loose floorboard that poses a tripping hazard, but it's hard to see that floorboard unless you know that it's there, I have a duty to warn my friends about that loose floorboard. If I don't warn them and someone trips and falls, that person could sue me for negligence. Finally, we have the duty of care owed to invitees. This is the most tested sub-issue within premises liability. An invitee is a person who enters the land to confer an economic benefit or who enters land that is open to the public at large. So for instance, a customer at a grocery store is an invitee. Here the premises possessor must warn or make safe all dangers that the premises possessor knows or should know of. 
If the customer at the store slips on a banana peel in the parking lot on their way into the store, the grocery store could be liable for negligence. Even if the grocery store didn't necessarily know that the banana that the banana peel was out there, they should have known about it if it had been there for a while, and so they should be making regular inspections of the premises to make sure no such dangers exist. Another negligence sub-issue that is frequently tested is negligence per se. You should generally discuss this if the fact pattern includes some sort of statute that the defendant has violated. The negligence per se doctrine allows the plaintiff to conclusively prove the duty and breach elements of negligence, but the plaintiff will still have to show causation and harm. Negligence per se has three requirements. The, number one, the defendant violated a statute without excuse. Two, the plaintiff was within the class of people the statute aimed to protect. And three, the plaintiff received the injury that the statute aimed to prevent. For example, if the defendant is driving his car over the speed limit and gets into an accident, he violated a statute by speeding. The other driver is within the class of people that the statute is designed to protect, and the injury, the car accident, is exactly the type of injury the speed limit is designed to prevent. So the plaintiff could sue that driver under a theory of negligence per se. I mentioned that one of the other topics that frequently appears in torts questions is intentional torts. You should be prepared to discuss intentional torts such as battery, assault, false imprisonment, trespass, conversion, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Often when these are tested, you will need to discuss multiple potential torts that a defendant might be liable for. Product liability and nuisance are also somewhat frequently tested on the torts essays. I mentioned earlier that nuisance could come up in a real property essay, so be aware that you might have to discuss this issue, even if it seems like the rest of the essay question involves issues from real property law. In order to sue for a private nuisance, the plaintiff must show that there is a substantial, unreasonable interference with the plaintiff's use or enjoyment of her property. So if a factory, let's say, emits some smoke that infiltrates the plaintiff's property and prevents the plaintiff from ever being able to go outside, that might be considered a substantial, unreasonable interference. For a public nuisance, the plaintiff must show that the act unreasonably interferes with the health, safety, or morals of the community, and that the plaintiff has suffered unique damages. So for example, let's say an oil spill shuts down a public beach. Everyone is prohibited from using that beach and none of those people have unique damages. However, if one person is a surf instructor and their primary source of income is teaching surf lessons at that beach that is now shut down, that person likely has unique damages and could sue under a theory of public nuisance. The third tip for torts questions is to be aware of how to approach highly tested torts topics. For instance, when negligence is tested, you should discuss the elements of negligence, so duty, breach, causation, and harm, and the defenses. And you should mention all of the negligence defenses, assumption of the risk, contributory negligence, and comparative negligence. Even though most jurisdictions have abolished contributory negligence, you should still discuss it. Another tip is when products liability is tested, you should analyze the plaintiff's potential claims for strict products liability as well as negligent products liability. Many students only discuss the claim for strict products liability and they miss out on points that are awarded for a discussion of negligence. The fourth tip for torts is to focus on negligence. Not only is this highly tested on the essays, but it also makes up 12 to 13 of your 25 torts multiple choice questions. So there are potentially a lot of points at stake from the topic of negligence. Finally, it is important that you practice torts essays to master the best way to approach this subject. This will also expose you to many of these highly tested issues that we just discussed. To get started, you should review the torts essays from February 2019, July 2017, February 2016, and July 2014.